Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to our witnesses and your guests. Uh, I want to uh, welcome all our colleagues, Senator Capito, and I'm pleased to, uh, to be with you this morning, and I'm pleased to be able to call this uh, business meeting to, uh, to order. Uh, in a couple of minutes, we're going to hold votes on five uh, nominees to fill important positions within the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, within the Department of uh, Defense, and the Chemical Safety and Hazard Investigation Board, as well as uh, to address four bills and no less than nine General Service Administration resolutions. After that, we'll take a nap. No, we will. After that, we'll really get to work. And uh, once we finish with these naps, so with these naps, with these votes, we're going to uh, immediately move to uh, our hearing. And at that time, we're going to hear from a panel of experts about the role we can play in promoting the transition to a circular economy. Um, I will have more to say on that after a business meeting, but for now, let me just take a couple of minutes to discuss the nominees whom our committee will vote on shortly. Each of these nominees from uh, Jeff uh, Prieto, Stephen Owen, uh, Jennifer Sass, and Sylvia Johnson are talented. They are well-established leaders in their respective fields. Importantly, each has demonstrated a deep commitment to making our country a better, uh, safer, and a more livable place for all Americans. Uh, let me begin uh, briefly with Jeff Prieto, President Biden's nominee to serve as general counsel at EPA. I met with Mr. Prieto earlier this summer and was very, very impressed. I believe he is an outstanding pick to assist uh, Administrator Regan and uh, leading EPA in keeping its policies and programs consistent with the law. Ms. Prieto has dedicated over 20 years, 20 years of his distinguished career to public service, serving across multiple departments in the executive branch. At his uh, hearing, he demonstrated the kind of intelligence, the kind of poise, the kind of forthright commitment to EPA's mission that will make him an outstanding uh, general counsel. I'm proud to support his nomination, and I urge our colleagues to join me in voting to report his nomination favorably to the Senate. Uh, this morning, we'll also be voting on President Biden's nominees to serve on the U.S. Chemical and Hazard Investigations Board. Let me just say a couple of words about uh, Stephen Owens, Jennifer Sass, and Sylvia Johnson. Each of these talented individuals bring with them a different set of skills and professional experiences that will greatly benefit the work of the Chemical uh, and Hazardous Investigations Board. Mr. Um, Mr. Owens, former EPA uh, Assistant Administrator of Chemical uh, Safety and Pollution Prevention, has dedicated decades, not years, but decades, of his career as an attorney and as a regulatory leader to protecting communities from chemical pollution. Dr. Sass has established herself as a well-respected scientist and leader in deepening the public health community's understanding of how chemical releases affect the health of both individuals and uh, our communities. And Dr. Johnson has built a formidable career as an occupational health expert, working closely with workers who have been uh, exposed to potentially harmful chemicals and industrial hazards to promote worker and operational safety. Her extensive experience includes working directly on hazardous assessments uh, and incident investigations that involve worker deaths from hazard uh, exposures. And separately, I believe each of these nominees uh, to the Chemical Safety Board is qualified to serve and make meaningful contributions to the Board's mission. Taken together, I believe their combined experience made even stronger by the diversity of each individual's contributions represents a great step forward for the work of the CSB, should they all be confirmed. This board is very much in need of their leadership right now, and I'm enthusiastic about the possibilities of the uh, CSB improving its capabilities and effectiveness following their confirmations. And with that, I'm pleased to turn to our, our ranking member, Senator Capito, for any comments that she would like to make on the business portion of today's proceedings. Thank you, and good morning, uh, Chairman Carper. I'm pleased to support two of the nominees for the Chemical Safety and Hazard Investigation Board, uh, known as the CSB. Stephen Owen stated in his written responses to the committee that one of his top priorities would be increasing transparency and information sharing at CSB. I welcome that news. I'm pleased to hear that, and I urge him to follow through on this commitment should he be confirmed. When considering nominee Dr. Sylvia Johnson, I appreciated her commitment in her written responses to spend the next few months of her tenure seeking advice and counsel from internal and external sources. She has expressed a willingness to work collaboratively with stakeholders. I appreciate that. I regret that I cannot support the remaining nominee at CSB, Dr. Jennifer Sass. 
CSB plays a critical role in analyzing why industrial accidents occur and how they can avoid them in the future in a technical and unbiased manner. Dr. Sass's criticism of the chemical industry included deriding the EPA for engaging with the American Chemistry Council about implementing the Toxic, Toxic Substance Control Act in a transparent manner. I was troubled by her attempt to conceal that attack and other statements right after the hearing by taking down her, she took down her entire Twitter uh, page. This knee-jerk reaction when confronted with hard questions shows that she's not the right person for a board committed to transparency. I also cannot support the nomination of Jeffrey Prieto to serve as general counsel of the EPA. The direction the administration is already taking on waters of the U.S., combined with Mr. Prieto's refusal to condemn overreaching regulations, mean that I must oppose his nomination at this time. This administration has announced plans in the environmental policy area, ones that I think could cause major damage to our economy and our energy sectors. Mr. Chairman, finally, I look forward to reporting five naming bills, including Senator Lummis's legislation and nine GSA resolutions today on a bipartisan basis. Thank you for um, having today's hearing, and I yield back to you. Happy to be here with, uh, with you and our colleagues. Uh, I want to uh, turn to uh, uh, Senator Lummis for some comments that you'd like to make, and I think uh, Senator, Senator Cardin has a comment or two he'd like to make. I think we're very close to having the, uh, the number of members that we need. I think we may be one or two short, so hopefully by the time uh, uh, Cynthia's finished and Dennis finished what they want to share with us, then we'll have the chance to vote. Senator Lummis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it, as the first woman to serve in the United States Senate from Wyoming, it really is a privilege for me to talk about a real pioneer uh, woman from the state of Wyoming uh, who mm -hmm. then finished her life in Maryland and is buried in Baltimore. Um, Wyoming was the first state to continuously grant women's right to vote. In fact, it was the first government in the world to continuously grant women the right to vote. This happened fully 50 years before the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Um, and Louisa Swain was the pioneering woman who cast the first legal vote in a general election under Wyoming law. That happened on September 6, 1870. Uh, so I can't think of a better name for a federal building in the first state to recognize this right and enshrine full suffrage for women into law. Many women played an essential role in the journey towards suffrage, but Louisa Swain's simple act of voting, though quiet, was the shot heard around the world. And she deserves, I believe, this recognition uh, for a federal building to be named after her in Cheyenne, Wyoming. And I want to thank both Senators Cardin and Van Hollen for joining me in this legislation. Um, after Mrs. Swain left Wyoming, she made her home in Maryland. As I mentioned, she is uh, buried in Baltimore, um, where you can visit her grave. Um, I know that both Senator Cardin and Senator Van Hollen are proud of their home state's part in the story of women's suffrage. Uh, as and being from Wyoming, I can't even describe how proud I am of our role. So it's a privilege to sponsor the legislation with Senator Van Hollen and Senator Cardin. I appreciate both of you uh, for this, and thank you for joining me today in this effort. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Senator. I, um, I want to turn now to uh, Senator Cardin. Well, Mr. Chairman, thank you. And let me thank my colleague for Wyoming for advancing this bill. Through the story of Louisa Swain, the state of Wyoming and the state of Maryland share an important piece of the history of women's right to vote. We celebrate Louisa Swain as the first woman in the world to cast a ballot in an election. Uh, she was born in Virginia. She lived for a time in Baltimore before moving to Wyoming. Shortly after casting her ballot in Wyoming in 1870, she returned to Baltimore, where she was laid to rest in 1878. I'm pleased to support this legislation to designate a federal building in Cheyenne, Wyoming, in honor of Louisa Swain. May it serve as a reminder of the long road women have traveled to secure the right to vote and the long road we have yet to travel to secure equal rights for women in this country and around the world. 
Again, I thank my colleague from Wyoming for advancing this legislation. Mr. Chairman, I would ask consent that I could be added as a co-sponsor. Without objection. Uh, and if I might, on a separate issue at this yes. time, uh, I know that we'll be considering uh, certain GSA uh, resolutions. One is a consolidated activities program, various locations. As in the last time our committee took up a similar resolution, I have requested a letter and have received a letter uh, from the GSA, uh, the uh, Associate Administrator Re uh, Rivera, dated August 10th, uh, 2021, to make it clear none of these funds will be used for renovations of the FBI facility located on Pennsylvania Avenue. I would ask that this letter be made part of our record. Yeah, without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. Uh, anybody else for a, for a comment? We're waiting for one person, Senator Markey, who is uh, under the weather. It's not uh, not COVID, but he is a uh, uh, hurting puppy today, and he should be walking in the door any minute. Anyone else while we're waiting for Senator Markey? Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman? Yes, please. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, and I, I'll say this to Mr. Johnson, who's one of the witnesses. I'm going to be, in case some people leave before we get to the second part of the program. We've got a great article here by um, Andrew Wheeler. Now, as you, uh, uh, that's know, a familiar name. I'm sorry? That's a familiar name. Yeah, familiar name. I think you, uh, you used to work for him, as I recall. So. He did a great <laughs> job. And consistent with his past behavior, the article I'm going to submit to be part of the record is a very long article. I don't think Andrew Wheeler has ever written a short article, but it is thorough and it's one that I think is, uh, it deserves the attention of everyone that, uh, in, on the committee and on the second panel. All right, without objection. Uh, any, any other comments? Any other comments? Uh, the man of the hour. Eddie, welcome. I, I called him last night and he was, a, he was in bad shape. I'm really delighted he got, made it here today. Okay, are you ready? Okay, got a quorum. And uh, so let's begin with the presidential nominees that they will vote on uh, today. First, I want to call up presidential nomination 540, Jeffrey Prieto of California to be general counsel of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. I move to approve and report the nomination favorably to the Senate. Is there a second? There's a second. Uh, the clerk will call the roll. Bowman, no. Discovery. No. McCarty. Aye. McCray. Yes, by proxy. Ms. Duckworth. Sure. Ms. Ernst. No. Mr. Graham. No, by proxy. Mr. Renhoff. No. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Lemon. No. Mr. Marker. Aye. Mr. Marker. Aye. He voted aye. Mr. Medea. Aye. Mr. Sanders. Aye. Mr. Shelby. No, by proxy. Ms. Stadenow? Aye. Mr. Selvin? No, by proxy. Mr. Whitehouse? Aye. Mr. Wicker? Yes, by proxy. Mr. Chairman? Aye. Clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, the ages 12 and the eight. Thanks very much. Next, I call up a presidential nominee. Nomination number 541, Jennifer Sass of Maryland, to be a member of the Chemical Safety and Hazard Investigation Board. I move to approve report the nomination to the Senate. Is there a second? second. It's been moved and seconded. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Bowman. No. Mrs. Cavill. No. Mr. Carter. Aye. Mr. Kramer. No, by proxy. Ms. Duckworth. Aye. Ms. Ernst. No. Mr. Graham. No, by proxy. Mr. Enhoff. No. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Lemons. No. Mr. Markey. Aye. Mr. Merkley. Mr. Padilla? Aye. Mr. Sanders? Aye. Mr. Shelby? No, by proxy. Ms. Stapnow? Aye. Mr. Sullivan? No, by proxy. Mr. Whitehouse? Aye. Mr. Wicker? No, by proxy. Mr. Chairman? Aye. Chairman, the yeas are 10, the nays are 10. To, uh, to expedite uh, this meeting, Senator Capito and I have agreed to consider remaining matters before committee on block and by voice vote. Uh, I would like to call up two presidential nomina nominations. First, I want to call up president presidential nomination uh, number 539, Stephen Owens of Arizona, to be a member of the Chemical Safety and Hazard Investigation Board. Second, 
call, I'm going to call up the, uh, the nomination of presidential nomination 542, Sylvia Johnson, to be a member of the same board, Chemical Safety and Hazard Investigation Board. In addition to these nominees, this vote will include a number of bills that name uh, post offices or federal buildings. I call up uh, S2205, 2126, uh, 1226, and S233. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. And um, all those are confirmed. We move. Very good. All right, I think that's it. Is that it? All right, I, oh, thanks to everybody. I know we've got a lot going on today. Thank you, everybody who made it uh, here today. So a special thanks to Eddie. And um, I hope you feel a lot better, partner. Thanks so much. GSA resolutions on bond. Uh, I'm about to call this hearing to order. In fact, I will call this hearing to order, and I'm going to invite our guests, our witnesses, uh, as appropriate to, uh, to join us at the table uh, with your name, name plate. I'd uh, like to start uh, this morning by thanking this uh, distinguished panel of uh, witnesses uh, for their willingness to join us today as we uh, discuss an issue, and I think an opportunity uh, of great importance, that is a transition to a circular uh, economy. A, a warm welcome to Elizabeth uh, Beiser, to Roberto Elias, uh, Brian Hawkinson, and Billy Johnson. And we look forward to hearing from each of you this morning. I got to confess I love the idea of a circular economy. Studied a little economics at Ohio State as a Navy ROTC midshipman, not very much, uh, but enough to get through, uh, through and on uh, to the Navy. But I love the idea of a circular economy. I love trying to figure out how do we use market forces to get things done. And uh, I like uh, the idea of considering um, the things and the materials that help uh, constitute and make a circular economy possible. Uh, materials that can be reused over and over again, instead of ending up in a landfill somewhere. As an avid uh, recycler and composter, I've always believed in environmental stewardship. Since my days growing up in a Boy Scout in Danville, Virginia, where we moved from Beckley, West Virginia. And over the years, I've come to feel even more strongly that it's uh, our moral duty to leave behind a cleaner, healthier planet for our children and for the uh, generations that follow. Well, let me make uh, one thing clear. Uh, driving toward a circular economy is not just doing something about uh, the disdain or disgust we feel in stirring the trash that litters too many of our highways and our streams. It's an essential part of the solution to a series of crises facing our nation and our globe today. Escalating climate change, overflowing landfills, and oceans that are choked uh, with a mass of plastic greater than the weight of all the fish in the sea. The actions that put us in this mess are not the fault of any one person. That's why it's up to all of us to work together on finding solutions. This is what we call in the Navy an all-hands-on-deck moment. Over the uh, past few uh, weeks, uh, several of our Senate colleagues and I, including Senator Capito, Senator uh, Bozeman, Senator Whitehouse, Senator Merkley, and others, have joined us in engaging with a host of stakeholders in a series of roundtable discussions on the concept of a circular economy and what that concept looks like in practice across a multitude of industries and levels of government. What we heard was in part sobering, but also I'm happy to report it was encouraging. Uh, we heard from solid waste workers about the challenges they face with contaminated recycling streams and the impact of China's national sword policy on their ability to effectively manage domestic waste, especially plastic. We heard about the need for better product design and infrastructure upgrades so that companies can have their products returned to them in good condition to be reused. And we heard about the devastating impact of the fashion industry on our environment. Uh, did you know that every second, almost a dump truck's worth of textiles goes into our landfills every second? 
and that the fashion industry is responsible for something like 10% of global emissions more than the aviation sector and the maritime shipping sector combined. I didn't know those things. My guess is that most of our colleagues and their staff, our staffs, didn't know them either. But fortunately, we've also discovered that with awareness and motivation, we can do a great deal to address the obvious need and change that these damaging behaviors uh, provide. One of those products that, uh, that stood out uh, for me was aluminum. And a few of us realize, for example, that 75% of aluminum ever mined is still in use today. I'm going to say that again. 75% of aluminum ever mined is still in use today. And that's important because aluminum products made from recycled mater materials use 95% less energy than it would take to create them from first use materials. Less than, uh, use 75% less energy. Uh, indeed, in most cases, uh, recycled products are more energy efficient, which translates, translates directly into reducing greenhouse gas emissions, something we all know we need to do. Well, that is the power of, circular, uh, of a circular economy. The roundtables also taught us more about the potential. We have to recapture and recycle the critical minerals found in lithium ion batteries. Of course, that capacity helps us nation, uh, helps our nation in many ways, driving us and our transportation fleet to a carbon neutral future and relieving us from uncertain and oftentimes hostile foreign sources for those critical minerals. And finally, we also heard great success stories from industries that have stepped up, stepped up to take more responsibility for the full life cycle of their products. And I'm glad to see uh, Mr. Hawkinson from the paper industry here today. Uh, welcome, especially. And with the national recycling rate uh, for all products, uh, I believe it's right around 35% across the country. Paper industry's recycling rate of over 60%, almost twice the national uh, rate, uh, really does stand out. And the paper industry shows how companies can and should help the cause by ensuring that their products can live on by being recycled into new products. Thank you for that example. I could say uh, we lead by our example. Companies uh, must step up and take greater responsibility for reducing, reusing, and recycling their products. And while we can't make uh, industry successful in this effort, we can help make it possible for industries to succeed. And we know that if industry, along with environmental advocates and all levels of government, join forces, join forces to reach these inspiring essential goals, return on our investment will be exponential. And that is our challenge to our witnesses before us today, and frankly, to all of us. Uh, please tell us uh, what our government needs to do to better ensure that you succeed in your efforts to establish a circular economy, one that helps bring our solid waste prob problems under control, reigns in unsustainable greenhouse gas emissions, reduces our overall consumption, and meets these, this critical moment in our uh, nation's history. Someday, uh, I expect to be asked in the future by our three sons and their children, uh, what is this question, what did you do to stop climate change and help?